All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Mark Merriweather Volderbruggen, PhD chemist and herbalist. He's going to say it one more time for us, just so you get the clear pronunciation. Mark, yeah, there's no, <laughs> yeah, there's no right or wrong way, but usually it's Volderbruggen. You just start at one end and go all the way to the other awesome. and hope for the best. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. Well, Mark, we like to, our Merriweather, sorry. Merriweather. We like to jump right in. And if you could start just by telling us a little bit about yourself and some of the stuff you like to do for fun, that would be great. Oh, cool. Okay. So I like to describe myself as a scientific wolf. And so what is the, I'm going to ask you questions. This is going to be a give and take sort of thing. So what is the purpose of a wolf in the wolf pack? I don't, I don't really know. To gather food for the other wolves. Ah, good answer. So to gather information for the other wolves, to study the environment and pass this information on to the rest of the pack. And so what this means in my life, I'm a scientist, I study nature and I figure out what parts of nature are most useful for humans. So as a PhD chemist and a medicinal chemist, I ended up on the path of plant chemistry and natural products to solve nature's or mankind to humankind's problems so that's in a nutshell that's what i do i am a scientific herbalist wolf type thing yeah awesome we'll just stop there <laughs> i love it i love it and when you aren't solving mankind's problems what are you doing for fun oh that is fun <laughs> but usually no so usually i am all my time is spent Passing this information on to people. I teach classes all over Texas. Uh, and actually, uh, Monday I'm leaving for Georgia, but I teach people the edible and medicinal plants around them, whether it be in person classes, podcasts, 100 hours of YouTube videos, all this sort of thing. My, my joy in life is pointing out all these miracles that surround us that apparently others have forgotten about, um, but luckily it has been passed on to me. And trying to trying to get people back into the whole nature thing especially yeah. through eating it and using it medicinally for sure for sure i love that and so what's your motivation behind this what gets you going every day and keeps you going so all right you asked i figure if i don't i'm gonna be eaten by a whale i i tell people i'm the luckiest person you will ever meet because i know why god put me here and that is exactly what i said to to reconnect people to nature because there's there's so much around us and we are becoming more and more separate from nature and it's causing a lot of problems on an individual level on a sociology or on a social level and on a world level and so my drive is to start with the individual reconnect them to the earth and hope from there some grand reconnection egotistical thing happens awesome awesome i love that i love that and when did you first know that that was like what you were supposed to do Ooh, there's there's different ways to answer this so a scientist is born knowing they are a scientist uh, even in kindergarten and first grade i was studying science way above my grade level but at the same time, my family had a deep connection with nature. Both my parents uh, would take us out into the woods every day and sometimes even bring us back, but take us out and you know, point out this plant was used for that. Grandma used this plant. Hey, let's sit here a minute because I think that bird is going to eat that plant. Yeah, it ate that plant. And so just this, this, not just the food and the medicine, but the whole interaction and web and tracks and you know, the, 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 the sun and the clouds and all this stuff, this, this great attack for nature. And I realized I really love it out here. It's really peaceful. It makes me feel good to be out here. Wow. I bet other people would like to know this. And I kind of fell into that accidentally. So if I can continue a little bit more, I, you know, obviously I have a connection to nature, spend a lot of time hiking and camping, all that stuff. Uh, I set up a blog devoted to hiking and camping in Texas way back in 2004. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of information on the internet about where to hike and camp and backpack and do all these things in Texas. 
So every weekend I'd go out somewhere and then write up my report on it and people liked it. But what really got people interested is when I mentioned some of the edible and medicinal plants I was finding while I was out there to the point where people started contacting me and said, hey, we're going camping next weekend. Do you, you want to come and you know, maybe show us some of these plants and mushrooms? It's like, uh, will there be beer? Yeah, there'll be beer. Oh, great. I'm in. Let's do it. Uh, and that went on for a number of years. But then the Houston Arboretum contacted me and said, hey, we hear you teach people you know, edible and medicinal plants. Would you mind teaching a class on that for us? And it's like, will there be beer? And they said, no, we can't give you beer. How about money? And it's like, I can trade beer for money. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> you got me. So uh, I taught the class. It was 2008. We did one class in the fall of 2008, did two in the spring. And then until the coronavirus hit, uh, it became a monthly event. There was so much demand for this information that it just exploded from there. And that led to book deals and TV appearances and <sighs> all sorts of plant rock star sort of stuff. It's been, it's been awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I love that. I love how you coined it as plant rock star. That's, <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> well, um, awesome. You've already told us a little bit about your vision you know, for teaching people and reconnecting people back to nature. But tell us some of the stuff that you're currently working on and where you see it going and um, just kind of how it traces back to that grand reconnection that you kind of alluded to earlier. Oh, okay. So one of the things as I've delved more into medicinal plants and ancient foods and ancient practices, I've come to realize that a lot of the modern health issues are actually due to the fact that the bodies we live in evolved in a much different world than it is currently living in. The world that we evolved to handle was hard. It was harsh. And we adapted, we developed certain survival techniques that became embedded in our, in our DNA that was passed on because they were great back then, but is really messing us up now and so my latest quest is to bring about cavemanosity amongst the masses trying to teach people different caveman things that they should be doing that will actually improve their health because a lot of people have serious health issues they go to gyms they spend money you know the ones that are trying to do weightlifting and things like that and that's great that's great it's very convenient in the modern world to go and lift heavy things in an air-conditioned gym but there are other things you can do that also have a great deal of of benefit to your health giving your body the actions and input and foods and medicines that it evolved to use so that's what I'm trying to do now is make people into modern day cavemen and cave women and cave whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us about some of those cavemen like things that we should be doing nowadays. OK, so a big one is mental health and giving your brain the input it requires. So there's been an explosion in attention and deficit disorder type issues and an anxiety and and just you know basically mental health issues and then of course if you've seen the studies on coronavirus and all that in the last year and a half due to that the incidences of of mental health issues has doubled in the population so way back in the old caveman days the brain was constantly analyzing the environment seeking out resources and well, seeking out threats. And so not only was it looking around, it was smelling things, keeping, you know, knowing what smells are in the wind. I'll tell you, if in mountain lion country, you can tell when a mountain lion is near you by the smell, if the wind is blowing in the right direction. If it's not blowing in the right direction, it's sneaking up on you. It knows where the wind is too. So one of the other things when you're out in nature, you start sensing which direction the wind is coming. Your the hair on your arms and exposed your in your head and so forth will start sending little signals like, okay, wind is coming from that way. So threats will be coming from that way. And so you, you start analyzing the thing. As you're walking, you're walking on uneven ground. They did not have paved sidewalks in prehistoric times. So the brain was constantly taking input from your feet adjusting your gait, adjusting your balance, 
and you know doing all these sort of calculations to stay upright. So long story short, being out in nature, walking on uneven ground gives the brain that input it evolved to want, to need, to function properly. It's like food for the brain. Nowadays, people do Sudoku or, well, just to date myself, Minesweeper <laughs> on the old Microsoft game. You know, but they're, they're not giving that, that input that the brain desires. They're sitting at a desk, looking at a computer, not feeling the wind. When it comes to smell, usually modern humans, their goal is to not smell anything or maybe coffee and bread. But other than that, they, they don't want to smell. Smells are generally considered to be bad, not a source of information. So we're, we're denying ourselves the brain's nutrients. Think of it as a sens uh, sensory nutrients that the brain craves, which then leads to it basically pacing back and forth inside your skull like a caged animal looking, I, I got to do something. Hey, hey, maybe, maybe I can poke this person. Maybe poking this person will, will be entertaining. And, you know, they start poking the people or the teacher or the coworker, you know, different things like that occur. So they're, they're not giving the brain the food they, you know, the brain food that it evolved to want. They're giving it some simplified, watered down, visual only, maybe some hearing, that's it sort of thing. That leads to a lot of mental health issues because they've shown being out in the woods, not only does it improve all the attention deficit, but it also lifts the mood. It increases the feelings of confidence and connection. It reduces anxiety. It reduces stress. It reduces depression. Yeah. Lots of good things. <laughs> <laughs> Those are a lot of good things. No, I love that. I love that a lot. Sorry, I, I, I have a tendency just to go and go and go until someone says, okay, let's go on to the next question. So what do you got next for me? Oh, no, that was great. I was just going to say I love how, uh, you know, those are things that I just never think about, about how we can like sense the wind and how our mind needs that kind of activity that we're just mm -hmm. depriving it of every day. You know, and what I like to point out to people, if you just, you know, went by the USDA daily recommendations of vitamin A and vitamin Z and protein and all that, do you think you would have a healthy diet? And the answer is no. There's a lot of other stuff out there that you need, you know, the fiber and you know everything else. And same with our brains. We we it's still the unexplored, you know, country where we only, no pun intended, scratch the surface. We really don't know what's going on in our brains. We have some ideas. We figured out there are different ways to tweak it, manipulate it. Um, but there's stuff it needs that we don't realize it needs, and it's just starting to come to light. And one of them is just being out in nature, going back to our our our, our roots, where we evolved. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And so usually our next question is about your first step on your journey, but I feel like you already talked about that a little bit. Is it there anything you want to elaborate on? Yeah, so if I can, the uh, as a foraging instructor. I see a lot of people, they'll buy like the Peterson's Guide to Wild Edibles. They'll go out in the woods, the deep woods, and think, okay, I'm going to find plants and, and eat them. And they look at the sea of green, and they look in the book, and they look at the sea of green, and then they go back home and go, screw that. Uh, everyone tries to learn it backwards. If you are serious about learning to forage and to learn edible and medicinal plants around you, the step is to identify the plants first and then go and look up their edible and medicinal uses. Don't go out looking specifically for lamb's quarter and dandelion and purslane. Go, okay, I'm standing here. What's around? Okay, we got trees. What are these trees? And nowadays with the apps, the smartphone apps with like the picture this and what is, you know, the different apps, they can actually do a pretty good job at identifying the trees. So you can, you don't even have to go through the books. You can just go click, click, click. Oh, an oak. All right, now we know it's an oak. Excellent. What are the edible uses of oak? What are the medicinal uses of oak? Yeah, Google that and presto, you know what oak can be, you know, the parts that can be eaten and the parts that can be used as medicine. You go through the trees, you do the landscaping plants because a lot of landscaping plants actually have medicinal and edible uses. Those are really easy too. You take a picture, you go to the local nursery and say, what is this plant? And they'll go, oh, that's Ellie Agnes. Okay, Google Ellie Agnes. Bang, whoa, edible berries. And you just work your way down that's how you do it. You don't go out 
into the wild thinking you're going to find plants. You got to identify the plants first and then look up their edible and medicinal uses. I love it. I love it. And so just curious, are you actually, um, cause I feel like a lot of people would hear this and be like, well, why do I need to forage and do all this stuff when we have all this technology and it's so readily available? All right. My understanding is you live in Austin, right? I do. Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Were you here back in February? I was not. I was in college. actually. Ah, ah, okay. So back in February, Texas got knocked on its ass by a winter storm Uh, that had the power out, the water out, everything. And uh, in the end, we live in a very complex society with all sorts of moving parts. And we're starting to see if a few of those moving parts stop moving, lots of other things stop moving. So if no other reason, food security and medicinal security, knowing there are nutrients around that I can access if H-E-B and Kroger, uh, suddenly I was in there yesterday looking for Thanksgiving turkey. There were no Thanksgiving turkeys yet. I don't know if it's too early or what, but uh, it can be a problem. Things are, uh, it's always good to know the edible medicinal plants just for that reason alone. Plus, there's just a feeling of being connected to nature. Is once you start realizing how amazing it is, you truly internalize why we need to protect it. There's a lot of people that say, yeah, you know, yay, nature, protect nature. And they are still dropping their water bottles and their candy wrappers and their protest signs and whatnot, you know, and everything all around and they really want someone else to protect nature for them but once you're the one eating the nature and taking the medicine from the nature you start realizing it's up to me to take care of this area where i'm at and so people start adopting nature and taking care of nature that's a good thing yeah yeah i love that a lot you know I am big on success and success literature and a big part of success is like extreme ownership, that kind of concept. And that is a part of extreme ownership that I think a lot of people neglect, including myself with um, just nature and the environment around you and Mm -hmm. taking ownership of that. So I appreciate that point. Thank you very much. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if there was one type of person that you could meet to Mm -hmm. kind of move you along help you take that next step in reconnecting people back to nature? Who would that person be and how would they do it? Okay. I don't exactly have a name in mind, Type of but person. someone who's really good with TikTok because <laughs> it seems like nowadays to really get the next level, you got to be kind of this uh, social media guru. And I am not. I am not, and I could, I just, yeah, I, I enjoy TikTok videos. I enjoy looking at TikTok videos. I've started trying to make some TikTok videos. They are sucky TikTok videos, but I'm, uh, you know, hoping if I, I, I'm looking at different classes and stuff and how to be a TikTok star. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. I guess if I really want to get my message out, that's what I need to do. I need to improve my social media game. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. So somebody who's really good at TikTok. Now, would you look for them to be kind of like a partner, an employee that you pay, a business that you outsource it to? How would that relationship work? You think? Ooh, oh, that's a great question. So two sides. In the beginning, outsourcing, giving them the information, giving them the pictures, giving them the videos and having them do, 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 you know, do all the jazzy sound effects and I don't know what all you do on TikTok. Whatever you kids do um, nowadays. Yeah, exactly. You kids these days. You know, me, you know, as a caveman. Uh, <laughs> but eventually, I would like to to take it on myself because every time you learn, uh, the way I see it, every time you learn a new skill, you make your brain young again. Like when they say to hold off Alzheimer's and, and dementia learn a new language, learn a musical instrument, you know, something like that. Because again, that brain is designed to constantly be developing new skills and it refreshes and revigorates and it re the brain. So I'm, I'm constantly seeking out new skills that I can use directly in my life, 
but challenge me and challenge my brain. Uh, like one thing that it, it doesn't directly, well, I guess it does kind of directly work in my life. I'm gone a lot. I'm out teaching a lot. Been married 23 years, 20, yeah, 23 years. Uh, for the last four months, I've been taking West Coast Swing dance lessons with my wife. West Coast Swing doesn't really come into play much with foraging, but having a happy wife really, really helps things here and allows me a little more freedom to do other things uh, because she knows Wednesday night is West Coast Swing night dance and uh, I got that going for me. So, and it's a new skill and I, I, I have like three left feet. I don't know. There's like extra feet in my way when I'm trying to dance, but she's happy. My brain is getting a workout. So it's a win, win, win. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And so are you saying that first it would start as outsourcing and then you would want to go on to learn it for yourself? Correct. Awesome. That's great. Or if I became really famous and then just let them do that, you know, I'd still, you know, I generate the, 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 you know, the, the file, the videos and all that. But, uh, yeah. And I, I kind of am working with a lady now that's been doing some stuff for medicine man plan co and she's been really good. Um, it's a part-time thing for her too. So it's, it's, I can tell she's already, she's excellent at it. But I think the amount of information and videos and pictures and say, oh, we got to do this. We got to do it. It's just like she's drinking from a fire hose, basically. It's, 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 it's getting a lot. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll see what happens. But absolutely. Yeah. That's all you can do. Take action and yeah. learn from it, you know. Exactly. Well, it didn't work. Let's try something else. No, that, that didn't work. I give up. Never give up. Yes, never give up. Never give up. I love it. Uh, name the most important one or two things that everyday people can do to help you spread this message and get people reconnected with nature. Ooh, okay. Learn the plants around you. Go out and just see what's out there. Don't consider them collateral bystanders that you walk by. Don't treat them like stop signs and stuff. You know, the, there's the old saying, stop and smell the roses. Guess what? That's actually some really good advice. Spend some time just looking at the plants, figuring out what they were. Teach your kids, bring your kids out there, your neighbors, things like that. It's it's funny uh, how many people I've taught over the years in different places, and then they've kind of spread, they'll be out puttering in the yard, and their neighbor will see them pick something and eat it. And the neighbor's like, you know, who's never talked to them before in their life, goes, what? <laughs> and they end up, oh, yeah, there's these edible weeds. They're, they're really great in this landscaping. And, you know, you got some there. And I did see you put fire ant killer down, so I can't eat yours, but... You know, if you don't put fire ant killer down, I will take care of those weeds for you. And it grows. And there's all these little circles of foragers around now that have talked to their neighbors and said, you know, convince them to use less poisons in their grass and so forth. It's totally unintended, but is perfectly in line what I was trying to do. So it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I take that to be a sign I'm, I'm doing the right thing. So I, teaching people, yeah. I guess my question is, are these plants not gross? Okay. That, and, and that's a great question. So there are levels of tastiness. There are some like wood sorrel that is absolutely delicious. Everyone who's taken my classes and has discovered wood sorrel goes and starts devouring it wherever they see. Then there's some that are just kind of bland, but very nutritious, like wild violets are really, really good for you, but they taste like, not even like cabbage, you know, like, like, yep. you know, let, you know, they're just, they're just there and you just throw them in the foods and there's some, it's like, yeah, that's really bitter, but again, they're loaded with stuff your body needs. And so I teach them how to take these different foods, these wild foods that don't taste so good and teach them how our ancestors prepared them so that suddenly they do taste good. And that's pretty exciting. So I do a lot of the, 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 the cooking classes too, not just going out and these are the things you can eat and make for medicine, but then also this is how you, you cook it or how you ferment it. There's a lot of interest in fermenting things. You know? <laughs> and just, yeah, how you do make good food out of it. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Just give us a brief little 
two minute tutorial on making good food out of crappy or not crappy taste. <laughs> <plants. laughs> okay. One of the classic wild edibles that when you ever, everyone goes, Oh yeah. Dandelions, dandelions. I remember someone saying they're, they're edible. So dandelion leaves are amazingly nutritious. They have some really good health benefits. They're what herbalists call blood cleansers and detoxifying agents. Actually, the secret is, is they just make you pee a lot, but that helps cleanse you out. But the leaves, the roots are very, very, very bitter. And so part of it is picking it when they're still young, when they're baby plants before they produce the flower, because once the flower appears, it gets pollinated. That plant is now pregnant and it goes, I'm in mama bear mode. I'm, I'm going to make myself more bitter and less tasty so that nothing eats me. But even then, humans have figured out, okay, if we take these leaves and we boil them, yeah, you reduce the bitterness, but you reduce it to this gunk and you would still have to drink the, the liquid that came off it because a lot of the, the, the stuff is water soluble. So you can boil it, but that's a terrible thing to do to it. Growing up, uh, when we would eat the dandelion leaves, my favorite thing there, mom would pour hot bacon grease over them and with a little bit of some crumbles of bacon and some boiled egg. And what that does is that flash heat does drive off the bitter compounds, but leaves all the other vitamins and minerals and all the other good stuff intact. When you're eating it, the grease has a tendency to kind of coat your tongue. So all you taste is, you know, bacon rather than the, the bitter greens. And it's actually a very good mixture. So hot bacon grease with some crumbles of bacon and some boiled egg, really good. But the other thing is mix the dandelion the bitter dandelion was something sour. The tongue can't taste bitter and sour at the same time, and sour overrides bitter. So a vinaigrette dressing is an ideal sort of thing. So you mix up the dandelion greens with you know, something sour, like a vinaigrette dressing, throw them in your sauerkraut, your kimchi, things like that. And then the, the acid and the, the, the sour from the acid really dilutes and changes that bitterness into uh, another flavor that we really don't have a name for, like sour bitter. But yeah, it, it, it basically higher, uh, hides the bitter. So there's, there's things like that. The, the whole concept of fermentation, if you're familiar with sauerkraut or kimchi, a lot of that, it was done, well, A, to preserve the food, and B, it takes a lot of bitter greens and makes them really delicious and very nutritious and, you know, and long lasting. What more could you ask for? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love that. Thanks for that uh, little tip. Yeah. I probably want more than two minutes, but. It was actually like two and a half. So you did a good job. Oh, <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. And so our first question is, what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Ooh, okay. So for the book, it's going to be Lord of the Rings. There's, if you spend as much time in the wild and, you know, living with a knife in a, in a metal pot, you really fall in love with the rangers and the elves of the Lord of the Rings. And, and I, I, my goal is to be a Dundane ranger, you know, the, the, a man of the West, you know, and and just survive by my wits and a bow and arrow and a knife in the in the woods. And I just I just read that story like every two or three years, you know, start to finish a Hobbit all the way through the Silmarillion and just get pumped up again, which also counts as the movie. And there's some good Lord of the Ring podcasts out there, too. So all three in one. That's awesome. That's awesome. Lord of the Rings, just all across the board. Yep, yep. What's one way you never like to, gets old? Yeah, yeah. What's one way you like to care for yourself? <sighs> Ooh, okay. Getting out into the woods by myself. A lot of the times when I'm out in the woods, I am teaching. I'm with people. I I have to be on. I have to be, you know, pumped up. And and while I'm doing that, oh heck yeah, I'm I'm I'm. I'm very enthusiastic about this subject and it gives me a lot of energy while I'm talking. Didn't tell. <laughs> uh, but then afterwards it, it, you know, the people go away and I'm no longer a rock star and that dopamine crash hits. And that's why I just have to go and reattach myself to the plants and just sit under a tree 
and feel the wind and smell the plants and just let nature flow back into me and remind me what I'm doing this for. Uh, you know, even in the Bible, when Jesus would get overwhelmed, he would leave everyone and go up into the mountains, into the wild places. There's healing there. So in January, I'm heading off to Big Ben for a week just by myself, uh, recharging, resetting, taking care of myself. Love that. Love that. Awesome. Well, what, what is one action step you can take right now to meet that company or partner that you're going to outsource your TikToking to? Well, I'm hoping your listeners are going, ooh, ooh, hey, uh, me, can I, uh, you know, how do I contact him? And, and it's pretty easy to find me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I've, I've, I've reached out. There's a few, uh, like on, for a while, Instagram was the big thing. And so reaching out, and there's some people I've worked with on there. Uh, up in Austin area, there's a wonderful Instagrammer by the name of Mrs. Barnes, who does food photography, who recently shot all the foods for my latest book on, on the foraging books um it was an adventure but now we're finding tiktok is a thing and tiktok you have to like dance and stuff and I'm, i've already discussed i'm not a dancer so uh yeah someone who can do dance lessons too beyond just west coast swing maybe that would help too yeah but uh hopefully someone out there goes hey meriwether let me show you my portfolio be interested in working with me and then I see they have, you know, 11 million followers. And it's like, yes, yes, I am. Please help. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, well, is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? Just, just to remind you, if I can, to, to, everything goes back to how we evolved. And you know, humans have been around for 83,000 generations. The creatures that led to humans started using fire wearing clothing 2.5 million years ago so we have a long history this brain in our head these bodies in that world and one of the things if you think about evolution it's survival of the fittest and going back to the foods and the medicines the things we ate nose to tail of animals you know the organ meats and everything but also the plant medicines and the mushroom medicines those that responded best to the plant medicines and the mushroom medicines were generally the ones that were passing on their genes. So when you think about herbal medicine, don't think of it as just some sort of crack, you know, crazy thing. Think of it, that's how we evolve. We are pre-designed to respond well to the plant medications. You know, most people say, you know, plants have no powers, that's all crack, as they drink their coffee and smoke their dope and believe plants have no power. You know what, plants have power. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I love that. I love that. Well, awesome. If you're listening to this podcast and you liked what Meriwether had to say, feel free to reach out to him, maybe take a course with him. Do you do online courses or are they all in person? Uh, I do both. Uh, the easiest thing, and because I, I suck at marketing, so pretty much everything online is free. So I have over 100 hours of plant video on my YouTube channel. Um, I do a lot of online uh Next week or the week after, I will be doing uh, 10 or 15 edible weeds of the Texas area for the winter, you know, 15 Texas winter weeds through the Houston Botanical Garden, uh, so people can sign up that way. But if you go to medicinemanplantco.com, there's an upcoming classes link and also link to my YouTube channel and all that sort of stuff. So I do both. I like the in-person classes because that's generally how I make the money. But, you know, people can also, you know, follow me even on Facebook and everything. And I try and post different plant stuff every day. Uh, and I will point out, even though I'm located in Texas, plants don't just follow geopolitical boundaries. They follow ecosystems and sunlight and rain. So all the plants I'm talking about in Texas, a large majority of them are found all over North America, maybe just at a different time of the year. Gotcha. Gotcha. Love it. Love it. Well, if you're listening to this and you loved what Meriwether had to say and you're curious, follow his YouTube, go to medicinemanplantco.com. Medicinemanplantco.com. Check it out. Follow all his stuff. And um, Meriwether, thank you so much for coming on the show. Guys, thank you for listening. Send this episode to somebody you think needs to hear it and just needs to go back and get reconnected with nature. So... 
on that which note, is everybody <laughs> which is literally so send this podcast to everybody in your contacts yeah this can be your christmas gift this year hey i got you a podcast exactly exactly <laughs> epic epic and so all right guys on that note leave us a five-star review on itunes and we're out <laughs>